I think one of the most important things that we do is educate you so that you can make really good decisions about how we move forward. Because quality of life is one of the most important things that we want to maintain. And we have to make sure that, to, to quote, that the treatment isn't worse than the disease. And so a lot of the research that's gone on has done a lot of good. If we look at cancer treatment 25, 30 years ago, it used to be a death sentence. Now, for a lot of different types of cancer, we can actually do quite well. We have 85% five-year survivals now. Those are excellent numbers considering where we were, again, 20, 30 years ago. And of course, the only way that this moves forward is through research. And as you all know today, because you've been raising it, that takes money as well, because it's so important, and for the Morris Animal Foundation, for the work they've been doing since the 1940s. So what is cancer? Basically, cancer is one of your own cells, or one of your dog's own cells, that's gone bad. So why doesn't the immune system take care of it? Can't we just use immune stimulants to take it? Well, unfortunately, that cancer arose in ourselves, in our, and if I were to develop cancer, every one of those cells would have a little stamp on it that said Michael on it. So my immune system wouldn't be able to recognize it. Just like if one of your dogs has cancer, it's gonna have a little stamp on it saying your dog's name on it, and your immune system's gonna go by, and it's gonna see that cell, and it's not gonna recognize that cell as something foreign like a virus or a bacteria, because it comes from, from within the patient. So wh why do one in four dogs now get cancer? Why do half of all dogs over 10 die of cancer? Well, one of the things is talking about food. Our dogs, our cats, my dogs, my cats, are living long enough now to develop cancer. And they're not dying of infectious diseases. They're not dying of distemper and parvo. They don't have nutritional deficiencies. So it's the good care that all of you give because our pets are part of our families that they're now getting diseases of age. And we know that cancer incidence goes up in age. Our dogs, our cats, have spontaneous tumors. They live in the same environment we live in. They're exposed to the same um, carcinogens that may be in our households or in our environment. And they also seem to have very similar genetics to us. And so as we make advances, let's say in melanoma, and the Morris Animal Foundation actually funded a two-year grant of mine looking at how to treat melanoma better, these advances can now go on to human studies and human patients as well. By helping our best friends, we can maybe help ourselves or help our family members because as one in four dogs die of cancer, the number is incredibly high in humans as well. So the work that we do this way is very important. Cats who go out in the sun, if they stay out there, they can develop squamous cell carcinoma. And it's almost always white cats and they develop on the pink parts of their nose or on their eyelids. So we do know certain things that can cause cancer, but we don't know the main underlying causes yet. We do know they're genetic. We do know that there's changes in the DNA. We do know that certain breeds also are more predisposed to getting certain types of cancer. We know that golden retrievers, for example, are more likely to develop certain types of brain tumors, more likely to develop certain types of um, lymphomas. We know, as Dr. K was talking about, that Bernie the Mountain Dogs can develop malignant histiocytosis, another horrible disease. And so now we have to figure out why. We have to figure out these genetic pathways, and that's some of the work that we do at the university, some of the work that's funded by the Morris Animal Foundation, some of the work that you want today to support. So those are studies looking at the underlying mechanisms of cancer. And obviously, to be able to prevent cancer, we have to be able to treat it in the patients that have it. So we run clinical trials. We do them in, um, with other practices. We do them with other universities. They're funded, again, by groups like the Morris Animal Foundation because it's important to be able to try new therapies, less toxic therapies, so that we can come up with better cures. And we actually were just part of a national study that was organized under the National Cancer Institute and through multiple universities, which was funded by the Morris Animal Foundation, looking at a new treatment for dogs with bone cancer. Right now, a dog who's diagnosed with a bone tumor, osteosarcoma, is if they get full treatment, if they have an amputation or a limb sparing procedure and then go through chemotherapy, the average dog is gonna live about a year. You've gotta be the advocate and you have to 
talk with your veterinarian and see what's, what you can do. We can also do things to control pain. So there's certain things we can do like radiation therapy. Another area that's really important for research and that the Morris Animal Foundation is helping fund, and so the work that you did today, your walking is helping fund, is setting up a national tumor bank. If we want to figure out what's going on with cancer, each type of cancer, we need to have the proper samples so we can do the basic research science that needs to go on in order to be able to affect cure. With permission, when a dog goes to surgery, or if a dog comes in with lymphoma, what we do is we take a biopsy of the tissue, and of course we send it off to pathology to find out what type of cancer it is, but we also bank it. We also take a little bit of blood and some urine. Again, this is all done with the owner consent and with permission, and this is being put into a national bank. And that's so cancer researchers are able to use this information to try to be able to figure out what are the underlying causes of cancer, what are the underlying causes of each particular cancer, and then how to better treat each type of cancer. If we want to continue in making sure that our pets have the same access to care and that we figure out the diseases in the same way, it's important that this kind of work go on. Part of our job is doing that, but half of my job is actually doing research to try to figure out how to make treatments better, how to make them more effective, and what are the underlying causes of cancer. The question is, if you have a dog who has a pink nose, or other white areas on their face, particularly if they're hairless, can you use sunscreen? That's pretty much the question? Yes. So you can, if, and because she's concerned about things like the sunburn that she occasionally sees when da Daisy, yes. when Daisy's out too, off, too long. So in areas where there's a lot of hair, it's a little harder to get sunscreen on. You know, and a lot of times my patients get um, areas shaved, and if they're out in the sun a lot, what we'll do is we'll recommend that they put a pediatric sunscreen on. Or if it's on the body somewhere that they can put a t-shirt on. I'm getting a little thin on the hair up top here. I have to, I wear a hat most of the time, and I didn't bring one today, but fortunately we're covered. But so yeah, sun exposure is important. We tend to think of um, cancer therapies as either surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy. So the question was, how does radiation deal with pain? So we have two different types of treatments that we do with radiation therapy. One we call definitive or curative intent, where we're hoping that we're going to get rid of this cancer for good, and the other is what we call palliative. I consider it hospice care then. So it's a way, like Dr. K was talking about, of making the patient feel better so that they can have a better quality of life and a longer quantity of life, but good quantity. We've come up with a lot better medications to control any side effects that might happen. So it's really important that we keep these lines of communication open with your vet. If something's going on, we need to know right away because we've got a lot of drugs, a lot of other things that we can do in order to ameliorate any side effects that might happen. Or, you know, if your dog's not feeling well after it receives a particular chemotherapeutic agent, we have to know because maybe we can give a medication beforehand that's going to stop that. Or maybe we need to pick a different drug or take a different tact in how we're going to do it. And so again, we want to limit the cost to the patient, and not only financially, obviously, but we want to limit the cost, the physical cost, and the toxic cost to the patient of any treatments we do. So I think it's really important to realize that most patients can go through without a lot of really bad side effects. It's a partnership we make with you. So if your dog gets a dose of chemotherapy and we tell you you have to come back in a week so we can check a white blood count, that's to make sure that it's not so low that we don't have to get them on preventive antibiotics so they don't get sick. It's important that we hear back from you if there's any problems so we can work on this together.